having inviting me along to speak today. So this is the first time I've speak, spoken at a PHP group, so it's a very exciting moment for me. Um, I'm going to talk to you about tools and techniques for reducing the environmental impact of tech you're responsible for, which is a mouthful of a title, I have to be honest. Um, I'll introduce myself properly first and then I'll go into um, a bit more about what I am going to cover and I'm not going to cover in this talk because it's a huge topic, really, really big. So, um, oh, let me see if I can get my clicker working. There we go. Um, so a little bit about me. Let me introduce myself to you. My name is Hannah Smith. Um, I live here in Bristol and have done for sort of 18 years, a long, long time resident of this fair city. Um, I'm a freelancer. So um, my background's in computer science, which I came here to Bristol to do and then never left. Um, and now I work as a freelancer and I have a number of different skill sets. Um, my day job is, is a, I'm a WordPress developer. So I work with SME companies building WordPress sites. So hence the PHP uh, side of things. Um, I also have a lot of experience in management. So I worked at the environment agency for seven years in total, doing all sorts of management type stuff. And I also do a lot of speaking and writing as well. I like sharing knowledge. And as someone that works on my own, I think it's really important for me to do that, to get, to get out there and to mingle a little bit. Um, so some of you may have come across me because I was co-organizer of the Bristol WordPress meetup for three years. So between 2016 and 2019. But I've recently stepped down to focus more on environmental tech stuff. So I've recently co-founded a meetup um, called Green Tech Southwest, which we talked about a bit at the beginning. So that's a little bit about me. Um, so what I'm going to cover. OK, so what this talk is going to talk about, this talk is going to talk about, uh, there's a bit of a mouthful, is um, how, so I'm going to start off by just talking about how tech can damage or impact the environment. Um, it's not a very much talked about subject at the moment. and. I'm surprised by that and that's part of what motivates me to come and do these talks is to share the knowledge and research that's being done around what the impact is. Um, we are sort of sold this idea that digital, it's all in the cloud, so it's light and fluffy and it, it doesn't, doesn't mean anything or doesn't cost anything to, to use tech and that's actually really not, not true. There is, a, is an impact. So I want to start off by kind of going into that and talking about um, the impact when tech is manufactured and also when it's used. And then for the second half of the talk, excuse me, I'll talk about tools and techniques that you might find useful to lessen that impact. Um, so that's broadly what I'm going to go into. It's not going to get heavily technical. Um, Dave, I know when we were chatting about this talk, you said you, you, PHP Southwest has never had a topic like this before. So it's such a broad and big topic. I'm the aim of this talk is to fire ideas at you, things that you can look at, things that you can research more, things that you can join the discussion in, um, rather than kind of deep dive into any one topic. So hopefully this is going to be very broad and, and really kind of uh, give, you, give you things to, to think about. I think whenever you talk about what something is, you should also talk about what it isn't. So what this talk isn't, this talk does not hate on the internet or tech. Um, I'm in no, I mean, I work as a WordPress developer, as a, as a web developer, and I love coding and working in tech. So there are some people who would say we shouldn't have any tech at all. I'm not one of those people. I believe tech has its place and I love tech and I love all the opportunity it brings. So this talk is not hating on any of that stuff. This talk is also not gonna go into climate science or talk about why there's a climate crisis. I'm going to assume that you as an audience are choosing to come and listen to this talk today because you already know that we have some serious issues that we as a society need to address. Um, if that's something you do want some more information about, you can have a look at the IPCC website, International pa Panel on Climate Change. Um, so these slides I'm going to make available as a link, as a, as a PDF, um, so all of the links that you can see, you can click on and, and follow through to find more information if, if you want to. Um, and the other thing that this talk isn't is statistically exact. If you start looking on the internet for numbers, specific numbers about how much carbon is produced when you do X activity or Y activity, 
it's a bit of a minefield, it's a bit of a pickle. So, and we'll talk about some of the reasons for why that is uh, during the talk. Um, so I've used the most credible sources I can find. I credited them all. Um, so, uh, you know, please just take all the numbers with a bit of a pinch of salt and just use your common sense. Um, when you're looking at numbers across the internet and you're looking at articles. And as I say, we'll talk a bit more about, about that when we get into it. Okay, so, and, and then just a little heads up. I don't know, maybe some of you know quite a lot about the environmental impact of tech already. Some of you may never have considered this topic before. I would be honest with you, I've always considered myself environmentally minded, but it's only within the last year that for me, I've connected that actually there is an impact here and it's not good. So some, some of this information may be a surprise or a shock to you, um, if you if you didn't know it before. But the good news is that there's loads of easy stuff that you can do. This whole field, because people aren't really talking about it that much at the moment, is ripe with low hanging fruit. So you can make an impact and a difference really, really easily. Okay, so that's just a bit of scene setting. Um, I'm gonna crack on with getting into into the talk. So I know I said I was going to start off by just giving an overview of um, the, the impact of tech, but before I do that, I think it's really important to say what I'm about to say next. Um, reducing the environmental impact of tech is not just a tool and a code problem. Now I know a lot of us as techies our instincts are, oh, let me fix this or make this better by creating a new tool or creating new code. There is definitely a place for that, but actually, really what we need to be doing is making a difference by some of these things. They're, they, they're human things, they're behavioral things. Um, it's not just, I guess what I'm trying to say is that you don't need to run off and make more tech in order to fix this problem we can already make an enormous difference by using existing best practices. So, you know, looking at the performance of what we do, and we're gonna talk a bit more about that in a bit. We can already make a huge difference by culling data that we don't use. Again, we'll talk a lot more about that in the course of the talk. Um, not using hardware that we don't need or buying hardware or running hardware that we don't need and educating ourselves and others. So, I guess I wanted to put across to you that, that there's a really important human aspect to this and the human aspect of our behaviours that we need to focus on and think about if we're all serious about reducing the environmental impact of our tech. Um, and there's a link at the bottom of the, this slide here. I was about to point at my screen, but I'm at home, not in front of you all. Um, uh, there's a really nice article here by a chap called Paul Johnston that I think articulates a lot of that. Uh, the, the title of the article is to fix climate change, stop being a techie and start being a human. And ultimately, for me, this is one of my absolute mantras in life, knowledge is power. So if you understand the impact that you're causing, you can do something about it. So let's talk about this impact. Let's get into it. Um, so how can tech or how does tech damage or impact the environment? So let's just start off with some really high level figures. Some of you maybe didn't know this before. So the total life cycle of ICT, now ICT is a general term for tech. Um, you can largely equate tech, ICT, and I, I'm a little bit loose in my language, I'll be honest. I do also talk about internet in the same way. The internet is so connected these days that it's almost impossible to think about tech or ICT without bringing the internet into it. So this figure comes from a really prominent paper, an academic paper written in 2018, uh, linked to at the bottom there. And it estimates that uh, the total life cycle of ICT is approximately 730 million tonnes of CO2 per year. So when we talk about the life cycle, we talk about the creation of tech and the use of tech and the destruction of tech or ideally recycling of tech. That's what we talk, we mean by the whole life cycle. So that's a big number. Okay, what does that mean in practice? Well, that equates to about 1.4% of global carbon emissions. Now, 1.4% may not sound like a lot, but it is a lot. And we're going to find out how much that's growing as well um, a little bit later in the talk. So it's significant. 
Now, if you're like me and you're just like, what do those numbers mean? What, what is, uh, what did I say, 730 million tons? What's that equivalent to? Well, it's equivalent to all the fuels burned by the aviation industry. Now, it's not a direct equivalent to the aviation industry. It's not an entire life cycle of the aviation industry, but it is a direct equivalent to the fuels burned by the aviation industry. What I find interesting is how much press aviation gets and flying gets but we don't talk quite so much about tech and the wastage in tech. Hopefully, maybe some of us might start talking more about it after this talk. So it's on a, on a par with the fuels burned by the aviation industry. And just another way of putting that number into context for you. If the internet or if tech was a country, it would be the sixth biggest polluter. So hopefully that gives you an idea of the size and scale of what we're looking at. Okay, so let's talk about the manufacture of tech and the devices that we use. So manufacturing uses energy. That's no great surprise, but it uses a lot of energy. And in fact, it's estimated that on average, for, for an average device, between 70 and 90% of the total pollution caused by just manufacturing that device, creating that device, uh, comes, comes during the manufacture. So 60 to 90% of the entire pollution created by that device happens when it's manufactured. Um, and smartphones in particular are very, very energy intensive. Um, they are more, they're at the top end of that scale. So about 90% um, of its overall pollution happens when it's manufactured. And there's a couple of links down the bottom there if you wanna read into those details a little bit more. So just the very creation of these devices is energy intensive. Um, we also, many of you um, may have come across this before or know this already, but there's also a lot of raw minerals and raw materials that end up, uh, sorry, those should say raw minerals, not materials, sorry. Um, now the raw materials that go into these devices um, are quite rare and often very hard to find. Um, I was very shocked when I first learned this particular fact that producing one tonne of rare earth metal creates 2,000 tonnes of waste. So I think that's quite a shocking um, proportion uh, relationship there. And this bit is one of the bits I least like about this talk, but I think it's important to say um, if we were to pick on one uh, rare earth metal, we might talk about co cobalt. Cobalt is found in every lithium ion rechargeable battery on the planet. So your electric cars, your phones, etc. And there is a lot of research available to show that mining this particular uh, mineral um, has a lot of human rights issues, that there are very young children um, working in mines and adults working in mines in very lethal conditions, providing this raw material for our tech. So and again, there's a few articles there if you want to read up more about that, that, that you can have a look at. So there's a definite cost here. And then let's just talk about the e-waste. So electronic waste, so cables and dead, dead machines. It's a lot of impact from our e-waste as well. So in 2019, 50 million tonnes of e-waste is being produced a year. And the UN estimates that in 2016, only 20% of e-waste is recycled globally which is a shockingly small amount when you think about how much energy went in to manufacture and mine these things in the first place. I think this is a really good fact too. The EU Parliament uh, estimates that obsolete cables generated more than 51,000 51, tonnes of e-waste per year as well. I don't know about you, I have drawers full of cables, uh, you know, all sorts of old cables and they, they all add up and make, it, make an impact. So the first sort of ideas, tools, techniques, approaches that you can use to lessen your impact are really about thinking about the devices that you're using. Um, as techies, we all are excited by the latest advancements in tech, myself included. Um, but if you really are interested in making an impact, an impact on the environment, a positive one, ask yourself, do you really need to upgrade to the latest devices? Or is it just effective marketing making you want more? Phones in particular, upgrading to the latest phone if, it, if it's an option with your package. Just ask yourself, do I really, really need that? 
Um, one of my clients is the Restart Project. Um, I love them to bits. I think they're absolutely brilliant. And they are an organization encouraging people around Europe to repair broken devices. So not just techie stuff, but th things like kettles and microwaves and as all sorts of electronics. Um, I reckon there might be a lot of people here that might be interested in getting involved in something like that, in, in repairing what, we, what we've already created. So it's an option. You can help by making a difference by repairing your own stuff or supporting others in your community to repair stuff too. And another, th another thought for you to take away is if you do need new tech, can you buy second hand? Or even perhaps look for ethically made devices. And there's not a great deal of options out there for ethically made devices, I'll be honest. Um, but you can certainly have a look at Fairphone if you're interested in uh, a new mobile phone. So I'm just going to take a little sip. Okay, so I didn't want to get too deep into the manufacture, but hopefully that's given you some some of you some new ideas or, or presented some facts to you that maybe you haven't come across before. Let's talk about the use of tech. This is kind of more my area of expertise. I don't know a great deal about manufacturing, but I know a lot more about the use of tech. So let's get into that. Okay, so using the internet requires lots of electricity. That's no surprise, I'm sure, to many of you. And it's estimated that about 3.6% of global electricity is being used to power devices and internet usage. So that's not manufacture, that's use. 3.6% is about the use of our devices, which I think is a very high number. Um, now, if electricity was emission free, this wouldn't be a problem. We'd be like, okay, cool, whatever. It's fine. Um, but it's not. The reality is that at the moment, uh, to create one kilowatt hour of energy, which is a standard uh, unit used to talk about the um, to talk about the use uh, to talk about energy consumption, um, it, it's estimated that 478 uh, grams of carbon are produced for every kilowatt hour. Now, I'm going to show you a few like uh, equations and. Um, sums kind of using those numbers so we can start to sort of get a feel for what that means in practice. 478 grams on its own probably doesn't mean a great deal to you. Now again I can't stress strongly enough that whilst this number is very specific you'll see different numbers for different things all over the place um, but I feel this is from the International Energy um, Associ uh, Association um, so this, I feel quite confident in this number, that it's 478 grams of CO2 is produced for every kilowatt hour. So we're in a position where energy, the creation of electricity, is not emission free. Um, and in fact, um, back in 2017, 65% uh, of the world's energy came from fossil fuels. Now, I'm sure that most of you are aware that fossil fuels are not great for the environment. They produce a lot of pollution and that actually renewables and it depends where you sit on the discussion about nuclear. I'm not going in there. I'm not going there in this talk, um, but renewables and potentially nuclear are certainly more favorable to fossil fuels. So here's a question for you. If the whole of the ICT sector um, changed to using renewable energy, what percentage reduction do you think we would see in ICT? Now, I don't have the chat up at, at the moment because um, it's too many screens, don't know where to look. Um, but if you have a thought on what that percentage would be if all of tech moved to renewable energy, uh, I'd love to see that in, in the, the chat. I can have a look after I finish speaking. So if you've got some thoughts, pop, pop some numbers in. Okay, so hopefully some of you have done that. It's 80%. So this report done by Ericsson is a really, really great report, by the way, if you're interested in a, a quick guide to your digital carbon footprint. Really, really good. It says that 80, we could have an 80% reduction if all of the ICT sector moved to renewable energy, which is, I think, such an easy thing for us to do, especially in the UK. It's a no-brainer to me that we wouldn't all just do this immediately. 
So I think it's worth saying that, uh, you know, switching to renewable energy, your home, your office, um, and using that as much as you can does make a big difference. However, there is a caveat. Renewable energy is not a panacea. So creating renewable energy does still have an impact on the environment, for sure. Um, it's a lot less than fossil fuels. So renewable energy still requires tech and infrastructure to run it. It's, it doesn't just come out of the air, uh, unfortunately. It'd be nice if it did. It, it requires some, some tech and stuff to, to, to turn it into energy. So it's not a panacea. What we need to be thinking as a tech community is, can we reduce the overall amount of energy that tech needs? So looking at the manufacture, performance and demand of uh, these, um, of tech. And we'll talk a bit more about certainly performance and demand. So our first step as techies is to go, how do we reduce the overall amount of energy? And that we're needing and then the second step is okay so what we what we do definitely definitely need how can we gen how can we run that through renewable energy so first up let's reduce and then the second thing is let's make sure that everything we do actually need is from renewable sources okay right so moving on so again as i say this is kind of a high level talk i just want to throw some ideas at you and, and hopefully some of it will resonate and some of you will know a lot about this subject so i invite you to share what you know in the comments and i invite you to uh, talk to me about it afterwards as well okay so one of the things that i really want to talk to you about is is usage and de data demand we are all responsible as developers for creating and managing data. That's basically what we do. Um, and what has happened is because things have become relatively cheap and easily accessible, especially if you're fortunate enough to be in a rich country like we are, what we have seen is that the usage and demand for data is, is up. It's exploded in like a crazy, crazy way. So just to kind of give you some idea about how much it's exploded, this is a, another report from the International Energy Association. Um, and they, and I think it's based on some data that came out from a Cisco report. So they have mapped how data demand has grown over the years. <clears throat> In 1987, roughly, roughly when the internet started, give or take, just gonna have a drink. <clears throat> the overall data demand <clears throat> for the internet uh, was about two terabytes. And if anyone isn't sure about what these funny numbers, terabytes, petabytes, exabytes, I'm going to get into all of them in a minute. Um, I've, I've written them all out in the bottom right hand corner of the screen. So hopefully you can, you can make out that, that um, what I've written there. So in 1987, we started off with two terabytes. 10 years later, we, we jumped up to 60 petabytes. 10 years after that, we jumped up to 54 exabytes. And in 2017, it was estimated that about 1.1 zettabytes of information flowed around the internet. Um, one zettabyte, by the way, is a one with that many zeros at the end. Uh, where are we, zettabytes? 21 zeros. Big, it's a big number, really, really big. Um, and just to kind of give you an idea of how quickly this is accelerating, it's predicted to reach 4.8 zettabytes per, per, uh, per year, not per person, God, that would be mad, uh, per year by 2022. 2022 is only around the corner. So you can see from this data what an explosion of data demand there is, how much data we're generating and sending around. It's, it's massive, really, really big. Now these data demands add up to a big impact. Oh, I haven't put the animation on this slide. Sorry, I was supposed to, I wanted to step you through this bit by bit, but all right, you can, you can read it along with me. Okay, so, so that number of 4.8 zettabytes is roughly, it translates to about 50 gigabytes per person per month on an average. Again, please don't pick holes. These, these numbers aren't statistically exact but they are good enough to give you a guide. That's what I'm trying to do with this talk. 
So if we have 50 gigabytes per person per month, we times that by 12, we are looking at 600 gigabytes per person per year. Um, now, 0.015 kilowatt hours is a rough approximation of what, um, of the energy, sorry, let me try that again. Um, it's the energy required to send a gigabyte of data. So that number, 0.015 kilowatt hours is the amount of energy, electricity being used to transfer one gigabyte of data. Now, again, the numbers on this, I have seen all sorts of numbers come from all sorts of different places. Um, but the, a report I alluded to earlier, written in 2018, the energy and carbon footprint of the global ICT and EM sectors, um, is kind of regarded very well in the academic um, world. And so this number, 0 .0, 0 0.015, um, is an approximation from that paper. So you will see different numbers around the place. It's hard to estimate this stuff, and we'll talk about why it's hard in a minute. Um, but we'll just work with that number. So it's quite small compared to a lot of the numbers you see. So if we have our 600 gigabytes per person per year, and we times that by the amount of energy that requires, per person per year, we're looking at about 9 kilowatts. Uh, nine kilowatt hours uh, times by 478 grams, which is the number I gave you before. I'll just flip back to it. It's this number. Oh, it is a while back. It's this number here. So it's the energy, the carbon intensity of power generation in 2018 is estimated to be 478. So I'm numerically dyslexic. So if I read the numbers out wrong, I do apologize. Um, I just kind of get them a bit scrambled in my mind. When, that, when I'm trying to say them out loud. That doesn't mean I can't do maths, by the way. <laughs> okay, so if we take the nine kilowatt hours by, and times it by 478 grams, we end up with one person's data demands creating 4.3 kilograms of CO2 per person per year. And I don't know about you, I kind of look at that number and I think, okay, well, actually, that's not all that much. But it is when you then make it a worldwide number or a country number. So in the UK, our population is roughly 68 million. So that makes it 292,000 tonnes of CO2. And globally, you know, you're looking at 34 million tonnes of CO2. So these small things on their individual basis, a small email or a small file taken in isolation don't perhaps add a, don't feel like a lot. I, my point here is that we are so data rich and doing so much with data these days that actually when it adds up it does create a really 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 big impact and we're going to talk about this a little bit more in a sec but my opinion and there's a lot of evidence to, to show this is that a lot of what we do is just total waste it's not needed and that for me is the biggest thing that we can all do as techies is to reduce waste if it's pointless let's delete the emails delete the archives um anyway i'll come on to that in a tick so that may feel a little bit doom and gloomy um i mean it is and i did yeah it's not all great news but there is some good news efficiency particularly of data centers and of networks is massively on the up as well which is a really really great news story and a really nice thing to hold on to so the amount of energy required to transmit and store data has been decreasing by half every two years since 2000 and again this is this paper i keep coming back to facts and figures from this paper it's written by swedish authors um, it's linked at the bottom of the slide there these numbers have come from there and it's a generally a good, a, a good source of info. So I, I got a graphic designer to draw this slide. It's not quite to scale, I'm sorry. Uh, I didn't notice till too late. Um, but this is just showing you some of the numbers. So whilst between 2007 and 2015, the first and last points on that diagram, the overall demand uh, for data has massive, massively increased what we can see is the carbon footprint flattening off and not growing in proportion. Now, many of you will be aware that we as a society really need to get our skates on and sort out the amount of carbon emissions that we're producing. So my question to you is, what could we achieve if we started to get a handle on this data demand? 
and if, if demand actually dropped because we know that we're getting more efficient we could speed things up we could make a big difference here i, I think that's that's cool and, and a nice area to think about so i'm just going to fire through a few quick ideas of how you could uh, play a part in dropping demand so i mean the obvious one is improve the performance of tech that you create um, for example, as PHP developers, we could all be using the latest versions of PHP. The PHP engine got rewritten for version 7 and is so, so much faster. I believe it's twice as fast. So using the latest versions of PHP, this is a thing in the WordPress community. Perhaps as pure PHP developers, you know, this might be uh, just obvious to you, but within the WordPress community, because we're so focused on backwards compatibility, there's still a surprising number of people running their sites on 5.6. So, you know, we can do a lot here to just use the latest versions of PHP and of other types of code as well, can make a big difference. Optimize and maintain your code base. So I frequently work on WordPress sites that are four or five years old. And something that I can nearly always do every time is just go through the theme and find a load of code that's sat there, either doing nothing or even worse still, running and it's completely pointless um, i see a lot of kind of i was working on a site this afternoon that's got a lot of unneeded database queries they're just not needed i could refactor the code and get it all running a lot better and performance is something that i'm sure many of you will be very conscious of already so just be aware that not only is performance good for your user um, and for keeping the cost of running servers down but it's good for the planet as well so that's nice um, dependencies. Again, I see this all the time in WordPress sites. I see lots and lots of dependencies being loaded in or used that aren't needed and they do have an environmental cost. So sometimes lazy developer me is a bit like, oh God, I can't, oh, I don't really want to go through this and sort this out. But then the little environmental bird on my shoulder has a little word and says, no, you really need to, you really should sort this out because it matters. Uh, not just for performance, but there's a, there's an environmental impact too and be watchful of your content and we'll talk a bit more about content in a bit okay um, so other ideas only create and store data that you actually need you saw the environmental cost of transferring a gigabyte of data sorry i should have said that that 0.015 figure was to the cloud sorry it was a data data about um data about transferring data to the cloud um, so transferring to the cloud is significantly more expensive than transferring data to a local hard drive. So actually only create and storing the data that you need can make a really big difference. So reduce the size of backups, archives and logs that are being sent off to the cloud if you can. Um, stuff that you need to keep you can put into cold, st cold storage. Um, uh, you know what I mean, cold storage. Um, another thing I see all the time with Again, my experiences with WordPress, so apologies for talking a lot about WordPress, but analytics just get thrown in to sites left, right and centre. And although they do create slowness on the website, there is also this other environmental impact of storing the data. I read an amazing statistic. I mean, amazing in the wrong sense, um, but amazing in that it said that apparently it's estimated that 80% of the data that gets collected for analytics is never even looked at it's never even analyzed which i just think wow crazy amount um, removing apps that we no longer need so we are all responsible for our phones um, you don't have to be a techie or a coder to use your phone but it is tech that we are responsible for so removing apps that you don't need does make a difference because you're not getting the updates you're not sending data unnecessarily so that's something you could definitely do if you had a mind to and re reviewing our comms and social media um, reducing the amount of uh, unwanted emails that you get can make a difference some of you maybe saw an article written in the guardian i think it was oh i've lost track of time i'm sure many of you have um, it was fairly recent and when i say recent i mean like four or five months uh, that talked about the huge environmental impact of sending unwanted emails. Now, there was some discussion within the environmental tech community about the numbers used for 
uh, producing the figures. There always is every time someone will have a different opinion on the figures that should be used. But whatever the figure, even if you use very small figures, it's, it's um, eye-wateringly large, the impact of sending unwanted emails um, and receiving them. So try and unsubscribe from unwanted mailing lists if you can. And limit time on social media as well. I mean, there's lots of reasons why social media is not always the healthiest place to be, but it, pointlessly scrolling, just wasting time does cost the planet as well. Okay, so those are some ideas for you to take away, to explore. I hope that maybe at future PHP talk uh, events, you might see more um, people digging deeper into any one of these things. I think that would be great. I'm gonna move on. I have a little bit more content that I wanna run through with you. I'm gonna speed up a little bit. I'm conscious of time. Um, I did want to just talk you through the energy consumption by component service, which I think is really, really fascinating. And until I started getting interested in this topic, I had no idea that this was the case. So when you view an internet page, we'll just keep it simple, we'll talk about internet pages. Um, I'm sure you'll all be aware that you have a data center that prepares your data for you. You have a network over which the data travels from data center to device. And one of the reasons why it is so incredibly difficult to get numbers for uh, this kind of uh, activity is because of all the unknowns and variations that can happen within this process. So there is a multitude of different ways you can run a data center, some well, some not so well. We'll talk a little bit about, more about that in a tick. Um, the network, actually how the data travels to you, can be hugely different. So. I recently discovered that using Wi-Fi is a lot more energy intensive than using an ethernet cable. And that using 3G uses, like, off the top of my head, I think it's something like six or seven times more than using Wi-Fi. And 4G, even more energy intensive again. And 5G, well, okay, let's not even go there with 5G. So even, how you receive the data to your phone, to your laptop, whatever, has a different environmental impact because different amounts of energy are used. And we can't control always the infrastructure of our network as well. And then our different devices. So TVs use huge amounts of electricity uh, compared to say a mobile. Um, desktops or laptops as well will all have different amounts. But the clever people that wrote this paper did produce some good academic study, studies into how much energy is estimated to be used by each of these component parts. So it estimated that around 30% of your energy when you're, when you're viewing an internet page is actually being burned by the data center. 28% is being burned through the, the information traveling to you through the network and 42% is by your device. So networks is not really something we can focus a great deal on. So we will spend a little bit more time now just talking about data centers and user devices and some of the, some of the different things that ramp up uh, the energy use. So servers and hosting. Data, if, data center efficiency is a really, really key part of all of this. Um, some of you, I'm sure, will have heard of the, the term PUE or PU, depends. Uh, how you say it, I think most people say PUE, um, which stands for power usage effectiveness. And this basically determines how energy efficient data centers are, and it's, it's a number. Um, 1.2 is considered to be a very efficient data center. Um, you can see numbers up to as much as three. And basically what the number is showing you is how much energy is used by the computing equipment as opposed to the, co the cooling and other overheads required by the data center. So how much, how much energy is actually running the computing equipment as opposed to all the other gumph in the data center. So if you're looking at data centers, I encourage you to have a look at the PUE number and look for one that's as small as possible because it does make a difference. Um, if you are not someone I don't really tend to choose data centers. I tend to choose hosting companies. Um, the Green Web Foundation is an amazing research for looking at what hosting companies are doing in terms of running their uh, data centers sustainably. So this is particularly about what data centers are running on renewable or sustainable energy. 
Um, and so they published data centers, uh, data sets as an SQL light open data set about which providers are running on green energy. And they've also developed a little add on for Lighthouse. If you're running Lighthouse on the command line, um, they've developed a little uh, add on called Greenhouse, which is brilliant. Um, so you can use that to uh, check what, what servers are being run on. OK, so I'm just going to talk to you about a couple of other tools that I've come across. Um, OK, so this one, a tool for determining a, a website's carbon emission. This is a great tool, especially if you're just interested in getting started with this kind of topic. Um, it's uh, actually developed by a WordPress agency in London called Whole Grain Digital, and they've put a huge amount of time and energy into creating this tool. You can put a URL in and hit the button and it will have a look at how your web page rates. So this is my website. I've managed to get it to be cleaner than 86% of websites tested. Um, it tells me that 0.26 grams of CO2 is produced every time someone visits it. And you can see, um, in fact, it's using the Green Web Foundation's data set to figure out if the server is running on renewable energy or not. So that's a great tool for you to play around with. They even have a little widget that you can put at the bottom of a web page that will show you the numbers on every page. I need to put that on my website. I haven't got around to it yet. OK, so a few other things around content that I'd just like to introduce you to. Um, just, you know, we talked about data demand. We talked about how your device can use different amounts of electricity. And I think it's useful just to kind of put these two nuggets in your mind. Um, this is an amazing article, very, very in-depth, and you may enjoy reading it, about how web content can affect power usage. Maybe you've even seen it. I think it came out in about October last year. Um, basically, the, the upshot of it is that JavaScript uses a lot more power on your device um, than not JavaScript. So try and minimize the amount of JavaScript that you're using. Now, this isn't a JavaScript meetup, so we don't need to say any more than that. Um, but yeah, just be aware of that. Um, and ads, adverts as well. Um, actually, embedding adverts on websites will use huge amounts more electricity because they're often pulled in with JavaScript and there's a lot going on to pull those adverts in a lot more processing power to figure out what adverts to serve you and all this kind of stuff. So this is another really nice little tool that you can have a look at. It's called web, Website Test Speed, and you can look at websites with and without an ad blocker and see the impact on the environment when you don't have adverts, which is really interesting. Okay, so let's just talk very quickly about making content. Now, when I give this talk to a WordPress community, I know that the a lot of people, um, a lot of the audience will be content creators and so they're working front end. I feel that probably as a PHP community there'd be a little bit uh, more of you be focused on the back end so I'm just going to run through this real quick and if you want to talk to me about it afterwards you definitely can. So tools and approaches for making content more efficient. So the upshot here is be efficient. Um, you know, we need to be efficient for so many reasons, for, for usability, for uh, improved SEO scores, all this sort of stuff. So there's a no brainer here to, to be efficient. Um, but when a lot of people talk about performance, they talk about page load speed. And that's not really quite the right metric to focus on because you can serve bloated content quickly. There's lots of things you can do. And actually what we want to do if we're trying to reduce the impact on the environment is to only serve the bytes of data that actually matter. So really our focus needs to be on page weight budget. I would like to show you this data. This is from the HTTP archive that shows how page, page weight has increased over the last five years. So you can see here on desktop, it's grown by about 1.6 times. And on mobile, um, it's actually grown by nearly 2.5 times. Now, my question is, uh, is the experience that we're getting on the web 2.5 times better on a mobile? I'm not sure. I don't know if all the data, all the stuff we're adding in really makes sense. Now, okay, I know a lot of you are probably sat there thinking, but video is um, 
a big thing and you know it's a lot of video that's creating this extra page weight and that absolutely is the case yes this is more data from the http archive this shows the kind of content type um, for a media for a i think it was a median web page so we can see that for a median web page 42 percent of the file size is video 35 percent is images 15% is JavaScript, CSS is 3%, fonts are 4 and HTML is 1. So actually, as content creators or as people working on front end, front end, the media, images and video is where we should be putting our effort to reduce the impact that that stuff has on the environment. So we want to be looking to transfer media content on demand, don't autoplay videos, lazy load images, for example. Uh, if you haven't come across these terms before, I'm sure many of you have. Um, there's a Google developers article that explains it really, really well. Okay, display images of the right dimensions. So if you're a front end developer and you're working with HTML, I I'm sure many of you as PHP developers do work with HTML occasionally. Uh, check out the image source set tags and the picture tags. Um, I wondered whether I should mention these, but in, in fact, the HTTP 2019 almanac says that only 20% of pages use the source set tag and 2% make use of the picture tag. Um, so I think there's some communication we can do about those HTML tags. And we want to optimize uh, our images as well. So for SVGs, there's a lot you can do to optimize them. I love this tool SVG OMG. Um, you can upload your SVGs and it strips out all this crap from your uh, from your files and you, and you can get them a lot smaller. And for JPEGs and, and PNGs as well, there's similar stuff you can do is stripping out this embedded information. Uh, Short Pixel is a great service for this. It's not just a WordPress plugin, there's also a, third, a kind of third party service that you can plug into and use as well. So it's worth checking out. Um, I started off by saying that being a techie and wanting to reduce the impact of tech on the environment is not just a tool problem. So in WordPress, I'm always trying to find ways to customize the back end to remind people to put the right sized images in or to uh, be, be mindful of their content. So I hope that maybe there's some opportunities, maybe in documentation or some of the stuff that you're working on where you could share and, and make uh, awareness of, of these impacts. I'd just like to show you a quick series of pictures. Um, I've been really surprised um, by the reaction when I've shown people these pictures um, about the fact that you can actually massively reduce the quality of JPEGs and still have a perfectly reasonable picture. So this is my dog, Lily. Uh, she's, I took a, this is a photo from a few years ago. Uh, she's in my office. I have a different chair and I've painted since this photo was taken, but there she is. When I took that on my camera, the image is 2.9 megabytes, very large file size, which you can see down there in the corner. If I wanted, say, to show that as a 14,000 pixel image, just resizing it, leaving the quality alone, takes that image size down to 716 kilobytes. So the previous image straight from my camera was 2.9. So resizing makes a difference. Reducing the quality, just reducing the quality of that image to 70%, which you can do in Photoshop or online, there's all sorts of tools that allow you to do this. You can reduce the size of that image to 231 kilobytes. And reducing it further and further again. So this is down to, 3%, maybe now you can see the fuzziness of that picture. Um, but at 3%, that image is 44 kilobytes. So I think it's really worth just putting this point across to you to say, you know, whatever you're working on, whatever content you're responsible for, really comp compressing your images makes a huge difference. I think I can't talk about content and the relationship between content and the environment without talking briefly about sustainable UX and design. If you are responsible for designing any kind of software, you are saving the planet a great deal of pain if you are designing so that your users can access their content quickly or complete their goal quickly, whatever kind of software it is that you're making. So don't make people click around for what they're looking for, make it easy for them. 
there's a whole oh, there's a whole field of expertise in sustainable ux there's a conference and a whole load of stuff uh, that you could have a look at if design is your thing a, a few quick takeaways from design ditch the carousels and sliders try and use full screen images sparingly if you can auto playing background videos are definitely bad don't want to use those and limit the use of different fonts there's a few things you can think about there okay so i've pretty much used my 50 minutes so i'm going to summarize and just wrap this up okay so to summarize is tech actually a problem does it have an environmental impact yes and no is the honest answer a politician's answer um yes it is an issue because as you hopefully seen from this talk tech has an environmental impact both in its manufacture and use and we are at a point where we really do need to reduce our carbon emissions very very quickly and we've all got a part to play in that and every sector should be reducing its impact and improving performance including us both as creators of tech and as also consumers of tech as well so our phones or our laptops is tech actually a problem? I mean, no, I can't stress strongly enough that this is not a talk saying we should get rid of tech. Definitely not what I'm saying. And I say that because the internet and ICT and tech has the potential to improve quality of life. Um, we know during lockdown, I don't know about you, but being able to get online has absolutely saved my mental sanity, 100%. It does improve quality of life gives you access to services and people and things that you can't have otherwise and also the clever use of tech can reduce carbon emissions in other sectors i haven't talked about ai today um, but ai can play a role in that actually in both sets ai is a big use of energy but if it's being used in the right way for the right thing it can make a difference so is tech actually a problem well yes and no Okay, so and the key points that I've made is yes, tech is a significant cause of environmental impact and it's even more shameful when it's wasteful. There's just no excuse for us to be wasting um, what the, the, the data and, and the use of tech that we have. Just because it's cheap doesn't mean it's not without a cost. And at the moment, what we're seeing is that the earth, the environment and people in less well communities are pay the price for that. So tools are helpful. I've shown you a few tools that you can look at. I'm sure that there's lots of other PHP talks around performance that you could dig into, um, but actually knowledge and behavior change is what's really gonna make the difference here. It's us as humans thinking and behaving differently. Say it, send and receive only the bytes of data that matter. And I really encourage you to get talking about this with others because I don't think we're talking enough about the relationship between tech and an impact on the environment. I've got loads of other resources for you. I highly recommend this book. If you've enjoyed this and you want to dig a little more deeper, uh, this is a really interesting book. It's called Worldwide Waste. I have a copy of it here on my desk as well, um, which you can have a look at. It's, it's newly out. So you can get an e-reader version of it or a print version. Um, there's some WordPress TV talks if you're interested in hearing other voices about this. And thank you. Um, I'm going to tweet the slides in a minute. Um, and you can stay in touch with me in this way. So I maybe have eaten into my question time. I will let um, Dave and Lee decide whether we have time for questions or, or what they want to do, but that's the end of, end of the content for now. Thank you very much. Brilliant, thank you ever so much. Um, I think everyone is, is clapping away at home. Thank you very much for that fantastic talk. Um, really, really interesting. If people have got questions, then there is a Q&A tab you should see on the bottom. If you click in there and you can pop your question in. Um, and actually, we've never had so much activity in chat while the talk has been going. There's so much buzz about it and you know, people asking things. Um, so we have got a question from Dan and he says, is there a breakdown of the calculations for websitecarbon.com? Oh, Elaine, how do they come around it? Yes, there is. If you go, I assume you can still hear me. I've stopped sharing my slides. So, you can still hear me. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> um, yes, I believe that the website Carbon Calculator has a, a tab 
somewhere on there which gives you more information about the data that they've used. They're a lovely bunch, so if you wanted to ask them questions, I believe they would respond to you on Twitter as well. You could at Whole Grain Digital. But yes, they have given more information about the calculations that they've used. Brilliant, thank you. Um, so Dan, hopefully you're happy with that answer, but if not, just pop something in chat. Um, if you need me to direct you to that link, I'm very happy to do that. Just, just ask me. Fantastic, thank you. Uh, I've got a question from Mark. Um, I'm interested in which is more costly in terms of carbon footprints uh, with a more CPU intens intensive relational DB versus storage in a NoSQL database like MongoDB. Storage is cheap, but does it cost more ecologically versus CPU cost? Oh, that's a really, really good question. And off the top of my head, I don't know the answer to that. Um, both have a cost. I can certainly direct you to some more reading around that. But I just, actually, I haven't come across any articles or papers yet. Not saying they're not there. I'm just saying I haven't come across them that talks about database ins and outs. I see a lot of stuff about talking about the cloud in general, but not so much about databases. So maybe other people know about stuff. Um, but I, I'm not going to try and answer that question because I don't know the answer to it. It's a really fascinating question, though, and I'd like to know the answer to that. Definitely. Cool. Yeah, sorry. There's so much to know on this topic. Uh, yeah, that one I don't know. That's a great question. Hmm. Uh, well, th thanks for that question, Mark. Um, Sorry, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> I, I suppose um, I suppose I have a, a, a kind of question when I was um, uh, listening to this, when you're kind of talking about the the costs in terms of environmental costs for various things, in terms of like you know you said you could spend some time removing. Um, deprecated and legacy code from a, from a code base to, to speed things up. And I was wondering, I, I suppose it depends where in the world that developer is, but like what's the carbon footprint of a day's development? And then how, how do you, you know, if it's a infrequently visited website, then maybe keeping it at 5.2 doesn't matter. Whereas if it's a frequently, and you know, frequently used one, then maybe moving up to 7.4 is good. And then how do you know the relative costs of what a developer's um co2 footprint is and, and, and things like that so it's kind of yeah how does that kind of make make sense no, it, it does i mean i think again that's an absolutely fascinating question to ask and i think i would love more people to be asking these kind of questions and feeling motivated to go and find the answers because actually when you start trying to find this information on the internet it's not easy to find i mean you said at the beginning maybe the speakers have taken hours to prepare this talk this has taken five days of mm. research trying to trying to pin down answers to these very very questions um, but the short answer is yes absolutely scale matters so the cost of a developer working on something on a site that's going to be visited 10 times a, 10 times a month is not really worth it but when you start looking at thousands of visits per day that scale really, really starts to matter. So I can't give you a hard and fast answer, but I think your thinking is absolutely right in terms of wondering about that. Mm. It's exactly the kind of place we need to get to, asking ourselves, does this make a difference? Um, I think the vast majority of the time is yes, actually. Yeah. <laughs> These small things matter. Yeah. I, I, I suppose, so anyone else got any more, any more questions? Uh... I can ask my flippant end, end, of, end, of, end of the talk question. So, a controversial Trump tweet, how much energy does that take? Oh, tweeting, yes. Well, I guess it depends on the number of people that reply to it and get incensed and decide to share it. <laughs> I mean, again, I mean, we could figure that out by working out the rough file size of downloading that tweet and then using those figures I gave you before of uh, 0.015 kilowatt hours per gigabyte yeah. and then timesing that by 478 grams and we could come to an answer on that um, but far more than it's worth would yeah. be my honest <laughs> opinion <laughs> yeah uh, yeah <It's> a good... <laughs> I like your flip and end question that's a really really good one 
I have actually seen some people talk about, um, I have actually seen some data around this before and actually someone converted <laughs> the cost of the tweets into farts. <laughs> And you, you can actually make an equation that way as well. So it has been done. Yeah. Literally hot air. Right. <laughs> yeah. Thank you ever so much. That was a fantastic okay. talk. Um, it's, uh, yeah, certainly a, a completely novel one for PHP Southwest. And I think, well, I'm certainly going to go away and start thinking about all this. And, uh, and I'm sure many, many others are as well. Um, so, yes, thank you ever so much for that. Um, we're pleasure. gonna thank have... you for having me. It's oh, really, really nice to be invited. If you want to speak again, just just let us know. Yeah.